So one of the first things to understand when developing Solidity smart contracts is the concept of state. Solidity runs on the Ethereum virtual machine, which in itself executes on a network of decentralized computers. When we deploy or migrate our code to the blockchain, we essentially send our contract code to an address on the network. This is much like a public key, private key address you'd have in MetaMask, for example. Now this address can store persistent data, but it's worth noting that it's expensive to both initialize and modify that data. You can read data from a smart contract for free, but to initialize it when you deploy a contract is expensive and then to modify that data at a later stage so that the state of the contract changes and that data is stored persistently on the blockchain is also very expensive relative to a centralized database, for example. Within our Solidity code, we can make public functions available to both access and modify that data, as well as execute general application logic. A third party user can come along and then interact with your smart contract via these public functions. If you've ever had to approve spend on a token or confirm something in MetaMask, then you're essentially executing a command on someone's Solidity smart contract. So let's look at some of the tools we're going to be using and setting up a development environment for creating Solidity smart contracts. So the first one we have here is just a simple website. It's remix.ethereum.org. And this is like an online IDE where you can go in and you can test things out. And it's got some really great features. You can actually compile these smart contracts that you can rate on the website. So you can do debugging on there and you can actually deploy them to like a JavaScript VM. This isn't quite the same as migrating them to a remote blockchain, but you're effectively running them on a local VM within the browser. It's a good way to test them and test out functions and make sure everything's working. We're going to be using this today to go through some code samples. But at some point, you're probably going to want to move over to a text editor and then deploy into a local test net or a remote test net. So for this, we'd need Node.js. So Node.js is a JavaScript runtime. It's a command line tool which can be used on Windows, Linux, or Mac to do all sorts of things. And one of them things is migrating contracts to the blockchain. So to do that, we're going to need another tool called Truffle. This is the Truffle suite. If we go to Truffle, so once we've got Node.js installed, we can open up a command line. This is Windows PowerShell. We can copy this function here. NPM is the Node Package Manager, and we can simply paste in this script to install Truffle. Truffle provides a suite of tools for migrating and interacting with smart contracts on a blockchain. The other really great tool that the Truffle suite provides is one called Ganache. And this is like a one-click blockchain that runs on your local system. So you can see this downloaded for Windows here. It's also available for other systems. And what you get when you run it is this kind of like copycat of Ethereum running just on your local system. You get addresses here with pretend ether, and you can kind of deploy contracts to your own blockchain and test them out and do unit tests and things like that. And it's a little bit faster and easier to deploy to your local system than it is to a remote testnet. But you can also use Truffle to deploy to remote testnet and also the Ethereum mainnet as well once your code is ready to go that far. Once we start using remote testnets and the Ethereum mainnet, we're going to need an API key for Infura. Infura acts as a node on the network. So if you imagine that the Ethereum network is comprised of a series of nodes, they're all interconnected and they form the decentralized network. Infura places a node on that network and then provides you access to that node via an API key. It lets you send transactions to the Ethereum network without needing to run your own node. It's free to use for, I think it's up to 100,000 API queries a day. And the final thing, which we're not gonna be going into too much detail with today is web3.js. This is a JavaScript library and it acts as a framework for interacting with Solidity smart contracts. If you wanted to build a user interface for your smart contract, you do that with web3.js and a front-end framework like React or Vue.js, for example. So let's jump into Remix now and go through some examples. So when we go first go into Remix, we've got this default workspace set up, which is kind of like a boilerplate for developing the smart contracts. We have three directories here. We have the contracts directory, which contains the Solidity code. We then have a scripts directory, which contains JavaScript files for deploying the smart contracts to the blockchain. And then we have a test directory, which contains the unit tests for our code. So we're going to be working in contracts. So let's go ahead and create a new file and we'll call this hello world.sol. As you guess, this is going to be a very simple application to store hello world in the blockchain. So the first thing we're going to do is define which version of Solidity we're using. We're going to be using the latest version here, which is 0.84. 
Uh, let's go down to the next line. We're then going to create a contract called Hello World Contract. And this is going to enclose our contract within the curly brackets. And then we're going to add a string variable called my state variable. You can see we have to define the variable here. This is much like TypeScript. It's a statically typed language. We're also going to define this as a public variable. That does a number of things. And one of the important ones is that when we compile this smart contract, it's going to create a getter function that we can use externally to get this variable from the smart contract. And we can see that this variable is stored at the top level of the smart contract in almost the same way that a global variable would be used in other languages. And the state of this variable is initialized and created when we deploy the smart contract. So let's go ahead and compile this code and see if it runs. So we're going to go down to the next one. We're going to make sure it's using the same compiler as we're using for our Solidity code. And we click Compile Hello World. We've got a warning about the license here. But generally, that's fine. That's compiled OK. And now we can go down and deploy that contract. So we're going to be using the JavaScript VM. We've got a test account here. The gas limits and everything are fine. So let's deploy that. And if we go down to Deploy Contracts, we can expand this. You can see this little button here. This is our uh, function that we've got, which was automatically created with my state variable to get that, that function. If we click this, we can see we get the response string, hello world. We've effectively using this contract to store the phrase hello world on the blockchain. So let's go back to the code now and make it a little bit more interesting. So if we just define this variable here, and we're going to create a constructor function. This constructor function only runs on deployment. So effectively, when we're going to define this variable and we're going to initialize this variable, and when we deploy this contract, that constructor function will run just once and it will set the variable to test one. We can then set, add a second public function called update var. And what this will do is it will set my state variable to test two. So effectively, this contract will actually have two functions. It will have the update var public function. And it will have the my state variable function as well, which is a getter variable for that function. Let's go ahead and deploy this and see what I mean. So we're going to have to recompile it every time we want. Check we've got no errors. And then we're going to deploy that to the, let's get rid of this one. And then we're going to deploy that smart contract. And if, and we, if we go to my state variable, we can see we've got test one, which was initialized when we deployed the smart contract. And then if we update the variable and then click my state variable again, we can see we've updated the variable to test two by running that public function. This is a very simple example of how you can store data in the blockchain and update it using public functions. So before we start digging into Solidity's code structure, let's have a quick look at how we would deploy this to the blockchain. So if we open up a new folder here, and we're gonna, we're gonna open up a PowerShell window and type truffle in it. We've got a standard kind of contract layout again. So I'm gonna go into contracts and I'm gonna open with code. And I'm gonna create a new file. I'm gonna save this as hello world.sol. Let's copy and paste our code from Remix into that text file and save that. We also want to edit the truffle config. So we're going to want to uncomment these lines. So we're going to need to install this HD wallet provider. We're going to put our API. Key. We're going to put our Infura API key here. We're then going to use a mnemonic. For the mnemonic, I normally use the Ganache mnemonic here. This is okay for testnet, but you will want to do it on mainnet, it's not secure. Then if we scroll down to the networks, I'm going to deploy this to the Ropster network. So we can just simply uncomment all these lines. And all we're going to want to do here is put in our Infura key. Finally, I'm going to set my compiler to use the latest version. Now if we go into migrations, you can see we've got this initial migration file. What we're going to do is set up a second file to actually put the code in to deploy the contracts. And this is fairly straightforward JavaScript code, which just automates the process of deploying that contract to the network. 
Let's run this and see how we get on. We're going to use the command truffle migrate hyphen hyphen network Roxton. So far, so good. So you can see we've actually we still got that error about the licensing. That's fine. We're doing initial migration now, and we're deploying the contracts. And there we go. That's completed now. You can see here. If I expand this, there you go. We can see that's completed now. You can see we've deployed the contract. Hello world, and it's gone to this contract address. If we copy that, we can then go to the Robston Testnet Explorer, which is at robston.fscan.io. Type that in, and that'll bring up our contract, which has been deployed to the Robston Ethereum Testnet. One thing I like to do is verify and publish the source code. So we can use Solidity single file, four, no license, continue, and then if we Copy and paste this source code into here. And verify and publish. We see that's been verified now. And what that allows us to do, if we go back to the contract now, we can actually interact with the functions of that contract directly from Etherscan. So you can see here we've got the test one variable. The other thing that we can do is interact with it from Truffle. So if we type Truffle console, Put the network as Robston again. And this is like a JavaScript runtime. So we can set a variable as high equals the hello world contract dot deployed. It returns undefined, but that's actually not an error in this case. We can then use that high variable to execute functions from our smart contract. So if we set high dot my straight variable, we can see we've got test one. If we do high dot update var, if we do high.myState variable again, we can see that that state variable has been updated to test two. Our Solidity code and smart contract is now running on a decentralized network, albeit the test net. And we can interact with that smart contract either via Truffle or Etherscan, or we could use Web3 to build out a user interface. So now let's jump in and have a look at the structure of Solidity code itself. We talked a little bit already about state variables. One thing to be aware of is that there are also local variables. These are defined within a function and they're not contained within the state, so they're initialized and set every time that function is called. Solidity is a statically typed language, much like TypeScript, where we have to define the type of the variable when we're initializing it. If we wanted to store text within a variable, then we'd define that as a string. If we wanted to store a number, we might use an integer. If we just wanted to use true or false, then we'd define that as a boolean or a bool. Because of the relatively high gas fees on the Ethereum network, it can be worthwhile optimizing our variables to have fixed byte lengths. The uint variable for an unsigned integer can be optimized to either be uint a or uint 2 i 5 6 to set a specific byte length for that variable. Arrays are quite widely used within Solidity, and we can set an array for a data type just by putting square brackets on the end. We then have some familiar functions such as push and pop, to get information in and out of the array and the array.length and things like that, which you can use, which should be similar to other programming languages. When we're defining variables, we can set access modifiers, and this limits the scope of where that variable is accessible from. So for instance, we can have public or private or internal or external, and a private variable would only be accessible from within the smart contract, whereas a public variable will be accessible externally. A public variable also has this getter function built in, which we saw in the hello world example. There are also state modifiers, which we can use such as pure and view. And what this allows us to do is limit the scope of a function to whether it can access and modify state data. This bit of code sets up a data custom type using the struct keyword. This is like a custom data structure, which is similar a little bit to a class where we can build up this custom data structure. This is used a lot in mapping. And we can map a key value pair, but the value can actually be a custom data structure for example, we could have the key as the address for anyone that's interacting with the smart contract. And then we can set up almost a kind of a database or a set of data that stores data on that person's address or that person's account. Conditions and loops should look very familiar compared to other programming languages. We can use if else statements or for loops to loop through an array, for example. That aspect of Solidity code should be fairly intuitive. And finally, we come to inheritance. This is exceptionally important in Solidity. 
Because there's absolutely no room for error when deploying Stability Smart Contracts because you can't go in and edit them afterwards to fix bugs, it's very common to use other people's code or open source projects like Open Zeppelin to pull in Solidity code that's already been audited and then use that and build upon it. Here we have an example using the import function to import some external Solidity code and then build functionality on top of that. So Solidity code is immutable once it's been deployed. That means that if there's a bug in the contract code, then once that's been migrated to the blockchain, a developer can't go in and make any changes to that. If they want to do anything, then they need to create a whole other version of the code, migrate that to a new contract address, and then somehow figure out how to move all the users and funds across. We can see this in examples like Uniswap, where they're releasing kind of V2 and V3, and then they slowly migrate the funds across to the new liquidity pools. This also makes testing absolutely critical when developing Solidity smart contracts. We can use testing frameworks like Chai to create unit tests to test out all the individual functions of our code. Another really good idea if the funds are available is to get a third party auditor to come in and look at the security. This is especially important if it's going to be handling financial transactions. Having a fresh pair of eyes or look at the code purely from a security perspective will highlight issues that the original developer might not have thought of. There's also a benefit to using other people's code here. The more functionality we can pull in from pre-audited smart contracts, the less room there is for errors in our own code. While you could argue this hinders creativity, it's also a great way to take your Solidity development to the next level by reading and using open source contracts like the Open Zeppelin contracts, for example. You can get a feel for what's possible within Solidity and also how them contracts are put together and the patterns that the developers are using. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and it's been a worthwhile introduction to Solidity smart contract development. If you're interested in learning more, then check out my blog post, which is linked to the description, which has all the code samples we've used here and also goes into more depth about Solidity and how to get started with creating your own smart contracts. Finally, if you found this valuable, please hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe for updates. Thank you for watching.